1888, at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, there were two men who brought a message to the church. Alonzo T. Jones and Alet J. Wagner were their names. The message that they brought to the church has become known as the message of righteousness by faith or the 1888 message. There are many today who wonder whether this message is still relevant for us today or if it was a message just for them in their generation. I want to share with you some statements from Alan White that help to answer these questions. One of the best known statements from the pen of Alan White comes from Testimonies to Ministers, page 91, where she writes here, The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagoner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Saviour, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. There are many today who claim to be reviving the message of 1888. Christ our righteousness, righteousness by faith. But is it the true message or not? The true message invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which would become manifest by obedience to all of the commandments of God. If the revival of the 1888 message that you are hearing of is not bringing about a change in the life, then can it be a true revival of the message? She goes on to say, This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. This precious message, Alan Wyatt here is saying in Testimony to Ministers, that that message is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It, it is the third angel's message, which is to be attended with the outpouring of the Spirit of God in very large measure. We today are praying for the outpouring of the latter rain. We as a people want to go forward and give the loud cry. In this statement here, which is very well known, yet often overlooked, it is specifically stated that the message of Jones and Wagner is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. We are coming to a time of crisis in this world very rapidly. The Pope's recent visit to Congress in America in September is a strong sign that the Sunday laws are not far distant from us. We are needing a message that will bring power into our lives, a message that will enable us to stand in the time of trial that is before us. Alan White wrote regarding this message in 1888 Materials, page 1814, the Lord has raised up Brother Jones and Brother Wagoner to proclaim a message to the world to prepare a people to stand in the day of God. To prepare a people to stand in the day of God. God raised up these men, Jones and Wagner, with a message that would do that work. Can we stand in the day of God without their message? According to what she says here, the answer is no. Ellen White had a very high calling on her life. She is known as the messenger of God. It's interesting, however, to note what she actually had to say about these men and how it was that she esteemed them and their calling. Manuscript Releases, Volume 11, page 257. She says... We have travelled all through to the different places of the meetings. 
that I might stand side by side with the messengers of God that I knew were his messengers, that I knew had a message for his people. I gave my message with them right in harmony with the very message they were bearing. What did we see? We saw a power attending the message. Alan White would travel from one part of the country to the other, just so that she could stand side by side with these men who she says she knew were sent from God, who she knew had a message from God. And as she united her message with their message, she says, we saw power attending the proclamation of it wherever the message was proclaimed. This mighty warrior for God, this woman of faith, considered it a privilege to stand by the side of these men. And she says this here in 1888 Materials, page 545. I have traveled from place to place, attending meetings where the message of the righteousness of Christ was preached. I considered it a privilege to stand by the side of my brethren and give my testimony with the message for the time. And I saw that the power of God attended the message wherever it was spoken. Ellen White was the messenger of God. And yet she says that she considered it a privilege to stand by the side of these men. She esteemed their calling of God as of great importance. As she combined her testimony with theirs, she says she saw power attending the message wherever it was proclaimed. Today, where is the power in our churches? We have a form, but what about the power? In her day, when her message was combined with the message of these men, there was power. She goes on to say on the same page, Suppose that you blot out the testimony that has been going during these last two years, proclaiming the righteousness of Christ. Who can you point to as bringing out special light for the people? This message, as it has been presented, should go to every church that claims to believe the truth and bring our people up to a higher standpoint. Does your church claim to believe the truth? If it does, according to the messenger of God, this message, as it has been proclaimed, should be being taught in your church. She had never heard the preaching of Jones or Wagner before. It was the first time at Minneapolis that she ever heard what Wagner teaches on righteousness by faith. People were very surprised at that. But she says here in Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 172, When I stated before my brethren that I had heard for the first time the views of Alder E.J. Wagner, some did not believe me. I stated that I had heard precious truths uttered that I could respond to with all my heart. For had not these great and glorious truths, the righteousness of Christ and the entire sacrifice made in behalf of man, been imprinted indelibly on my mind by the Spirit of God? Has not this subject been presented in the testimonies again and again? When the Lord had given to my brethren the burden to proclaim this message, I felt inexpressibly grateful to God, for I knew it was the message for this time. When Ellen White heard the message for the first time from Wagner, she rejoiced. She recognized it as being the very message that the church was needing. She says there that this is what I have been proclaiming for the last 45 years, the matchless charms of Christ. Many people tell me, See, I don't need to read the writings of Jones and Wagner. I don't need to understand their message. It's there in Ellen White. She says so. But is it important that we study the message of Jones and Wagner? There is a very revealing statement that Ellen White makes in manuscript releases where she talks about 
her teachings on the subject of righteousness by faith. She says, Manuscript Releases, Volume 5, page 219. I have had the question asked, What do you think of this light that these men are presenting? Why? I have been presenting it to you for the last 45 years. The matchless charms of Christ. This is what I have been trying to present before your minds. When Brother Wagoner brought out these ideas in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips I had heard accepting the conversations between myself and my husband. I have said to myself, it is because God has presented it to me in vision that I see it so clearly, and they cannot see it because they have never had it presented to them as I have. And when another presented it, every fiber of my heart said, Amen. Alan White says, this is what I have been trying to present before your minds. When Wagner presented it, it was the first clear teaching from any human lips that she had heard, except the conversation between herself and her husband. She had gained an understanding of these things through vision. And she says that because the others had not received the light in the same way, they were able to understand it in the same way that she did. A man by the name of J.S. Washburn was having a conversation with Alan White one day. And she said something to him that is very interesting. She said, E.J. Wagoner can preach righteousness by faith more clearly than I can. Why, Sister White, I said. Do you mean to tell me that E.J. Wagoner can preach it better than you can with all your experience? Sister White replied, Yes, the Lord has given him special light on that question. I have been wanting to bring it out more clearly, but I could not have brought it out as clearly as he did. But when he brought it out at Minneapolis, I recognized it. She says it was the first clear teaching from any human lips that she had heard. She had been wanting to bring it out more clearly. But when Wagner brought it out, she saw that God had given this man special light on the question. I recommend to people that they read the writings of Jones and Wagner and then go back and read Alan White. There, once you understand the message from them, then you can see what it was that she was trying to say in her own writings. There are many people who think that Alan White was very legalistic. But if you can understand the message first from these two men, then go back, you will find that her writings are take on a completely new shape. As I travel, many people tell me that they've never heard of Jones and Wagner or the 18 Out Out message. And their books are not always easy to find and sadly they haven't been translated into many languages at all. Why not? Alan White makes it very clear in Manuscript Releases, Volume 16, page 104. Why do not brethren of like precious faith consider that in every age, when the Lord has sent a special message to the people, all the powers of the confederacy of evil have set at work to prevent the word of truth from coming to those who should receive it. This is why Jones and Wagner have been so little heard of. This is why the message of righteousness by faith, as it was taught by them, is so rare in this world. Satan doesn't want us to know it. He knows that this is the message that will prepare us for the coming crisis. And he wants us to be lost with him. He doesn't want us saved. So he's been working very hard for the last 127 years to lead us down a theological garden pathway and divert our minds from 
the true message that we need for our salvation. It is the same with their books. They haven't been translated into many languages because they haven't been appreciated as they should have. Many people tell me, but these men fell away. Look at the later experience in their life. What good was the message for them if it couldn't help them? Well, it doesn't matter what their experience was later in their life. Alan White answers this one very clearly in Manuscript Releases, Volume 16, page 107. Should the Lord's messengers, after standing manfully for the truth for a time, fall under temptation and dishonor him who has given them their work, will that be proof that the message is not true? No, because the Bible is true to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Sin on the part of the messenger of God would cause Satan to rejoice, and those who have rejected the messenger and the message would triumph, but it would not at all clear the men who were guilty of rejecting the message of truth sent of God. If they fall away, is it proof that their message was not from God? No. Alan White says, to the law and to the testimony. The message from these men was according to the word of God. Whatever their later experience would be in life is irrelevant. If we reject their message, we are held guilty of rejecting light from heaven. There are many stories about these men and their later experiences in life. Are they true? Many of them are not. They're rumours, they're gossip, because Satan is wanting to distract us from this message and to find an excuse for not receiving it. But regardless of what their experience was, God is judge, not us. It's for us to examine their message, to learn what we can, and to receive the light that came from heaven. Rejecting their message is more than rejecting the light from heaven. Alan White makes a very strong statement regarding what it is that we are really rejecting when we reject their message. She says in 1888 Materials, page 608, the question is, has God sent the truth? Has God raised up these men to proclaim the truth? I say yes. God has sent men to bring us the truth that we should not have had unless God had sent somebody to bring it to us. God has let me have a light of what his spirit is and therefore I accept it and I no more dare to lift my hand against these persons because it would be against Jesus Christ who is to be recognized in his messengers. She wouldn't dare to lift up her hand against these men because it would be against Jesus Christ himself. To reject their message is to reject more than just light from heaven, but it is to reject the very person who sent that light, Jesus Christ. We read that around the year 1888, Ellen White wrote that she had been proclaiming this message for the last 45 years. Yet here in this statement, she says that God has sent man to bring us the truth that we would not have had unless God had sent it to us. She had been trying to bring it out. But God needed to send these men with a clarity and a simplicity of understanding that would enable us to understand the things that we need to know. Had God not sent these men, we would not have had the truth that we need for the crisis. If Alan White wouldn't dare to lift a hand against these men, I don't want to dare to oppose their message either. 
So is their message from God or is it from man? Who was speaking when they gave their presentations? Alan White answers the question. Manuscript releases, volume 11, page 283. The Lord is speaking through his delegated messengers. This is why she wouldn't lift up a hand against these men. Because it was Christ himself who was speaking through these men. She says here, 1898 Materials, page 954, that to accuse and criticize those whom God is using is to accuse and criticize the Lord who has sent them. These are just a few statements from the writings of Ellen White. But they're very clear and they're very concise. She took the message very seriously. And if we are going to take her and her writings seriously, if we believe that she was a messenger of of God, and she is identifying to us the importance of the Jones and Wagoner message, we need to take their message seriously. It's not something that we can ignore. We have a crisis coming before us very quickly. They had a crisis in their own time. But today we are even in more of a crisis. And if they needed a message, we need a message more than they do. We read before from testimony to ministers that their message was a message that God commanded to be given to the world. It was the third angel's message. Alan White writes that the time of test is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. First Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 362. She says their message was the beginning of the loud cry of the third angel whose glory would fill the whole earth. But we're still here today. Something went wrong. What went wrong? Alan White tells us what went wrong in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 235. An unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and to accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through brethren Wagner and Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world. As the apostles proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost, The light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted and by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. This is the problem. The leadership of the church in 1888 were not comfortable with the message. It was different to what they had been teaching. The leading brethren had been teaching another method of salvation for many years. And it was hurtful to their pride to learn that what they had been teaching was wrong. And so they resisted the light. They wanted to continue to teach what they had been teaching. They didn't want to be taught by what they considered these young men, little upstarts. And so they rejected the message and kept the message away from the people. Will the leadership make the same mistake today? We'll never know while the message still remains buried under the rubbish of error. If we want to survive the time that is before us, the messenger of God, Alan White, makes it very clear that this message that Jones and Wagner brought to the church is the message that we need. Yes, truth is progressive. There is additional light, but... It must be built upon the foundation that was laid there by these two men. If the light today contradicts the Jones and Wagner message, it is not the true genuine new light. 
But unless we study what the original message was, we will fall for the error. We will not recognize the true new light when it comes. There are many people that say to me, the message is already being preached. It's being preached in the church for years. Well, I say one thing. How do you know? Have you read the writings of Jones and Wagner? Only by reading the writings of Jones and Wagner can you know if the message is true or not. Yes, they did make mistakes in the later years of their life. But the first decade, from 1888 through to 1898, their books are full of light and truth and practical explanations of the message of righteousness by faith. This is what we're needing today. Something practical, not just theory and head knowledge. We need a practical gospel. The church needed that in 1888. And so God sent these men to bring something that they did not have before. That was a practical understanding of righteousness by faith. I cannot emphasize more strongly what Ellen White wrote in Testament of Ministers, page 91. She said that the Lord had raised up these men with a message for the world. She said, it is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. How can we give the loud cry without their message? How can we receive the outpouring of the latter rain if we don't understand what God wanted his church to have? The very message that Jesus Christ himself brought to his church through these men. If Jesus says in his testimony that he sent these men, if he says that it was he himself speaking through these men, I'm going to take that message very seriously. Are you? I have found in their writings the answers that I have needed for my life. There is a practical gospel there that makes sense. It is logical. We today are lacking in a logical gospel. The youth are running away from the church because the religion doesn't make sense anymore. But our God is an awesome God. He's a highly intelligent being. We look at nature. Everything there is perfectly logical. His gospel should be logical. But instead we have cliches and wonderful phrases that don't make any sense to us. We need the message that these men brought to the church. It is a message not just for us, but God commanded it to be taken to the world. The world will see it, will hear it. They will see something that makes sense. But if we don't receive it, how can we ever teach it to others?